floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. And I will start with sharing my presentation. And I hope it will work. And now I hope that you see the, the first slide there. Um, so wetland restoration as part of, of nature restoration, nature recovery, it's almost adverted as something that will solve all our problems. Uh, if you look at EU policies and also the latest EU calls for research, nature restoration is really something that is um, that is highlighted in many of these calls um, and as something that promotes a lot of ecosystem services. And in this talk, I will address some potential disservices that nature restoration might cause. I don't have all the answers, um, but at least I would like to, to raise some, some issues that might be associated with wetland restoration. So what I will talk about is really this, this question if nature restoration mitigates risk for infectious diseases and the focus will be on vector-borne and zoonotic ones. Um, and if wetlands, with a focus now on wetlands, are a potential source of infectious diseases, and if they are, um, are there potential nature-based solutions that can solve the problem, or are nature-based solutions even a cause of the problem? And if there's a problem, then even further, how can we mitigate the problem, solve the problem? And there I will also look into a few public health interventions that potentially can be used to mitigate the problem. Before I start, um, I would like to more or less de define three important terms that I will frequently use vector, reservoir, and zoonosis. Um, zoonosis pre-pandemic, this, this was a term that I had frequently uh, to, to explain. Nowadays, um, most of us are familiar with the term, but for the zoonosis, one thing that I would like to highlight is, is it that it's not just a disease that might be transferred or transmitted from non-human animals to humans, but also the other way around, that is transmitted from humans to animals. And then if we look at the vectors, I will bring up uh, some examples of especially mosquitoes as vectors, that is um, agents that allow the reproduction and transmission of pathogens to a vertebrate host, whether it's a human or non-human animal. Um, ticks and mosquitoes are the examples I will uh, mention today. And then also reservoir, as opposed to a host where reservoir is an environment where the pathogen normally lives, grows, and multiplies. Um, and that can then be abiotic environment, um, soil, water, or biotic. So these are three terms um, that I will come back to quite frequently now. Okay, so why we are having the, this Merlin project is there's substantial habitat destruction at a global scale, not only related to wetlands, but multiple habitats. And this destruction has resulted in a loss of biodiversity, and this is something that has been also highlighted as increasing disease risk. And of course, we don't want anything of this to happen. And this is something that has been also uh, published in one of the latest IPBS uh, workshop reports. And if we say this cascade is true, then the question is, 
this if we try to reverse this cascade that is we restore habitat with this restoration we assume and hope for that this will also increase biodiversity so these are of course two things that we want to happen but then as a third consequence um some slight problem here it comes um if we increase biodiversity does that then actually result also in a decrease in disease risk this is really an open question i would say even though if we look at this ipbs workshop report on biodiversity and pandemics there it's more or less the narrative that biodiversity mitigates disease risk. But also in this report, I would say the, the view of biodiversity is a bit naive. And I think we need to be a bit more careful regarding these simple assumptions that, a, that an increase in biodiversity always results in decreased disease risk. And I will exemplify this now further. So we want to increase ecosystem services by restoration. But is it that this risks to create and promote potential disservices, any undesirable effects? So we have a sick patient illustrated here by the hand with a plant in, in red, and we apply different medi medications there and we hope that the patient recovers and gets healthy but what if our medications and here the nature restorations has any undesirable effects and that is this potential effect of increase in infectious diseases caused by nature restoration and wetland restoration in particular. So there is something called the biodiversity is good for our health paradigm. And here, the figure that you see here to the left, where we put pathogen diversity as against host diversity, there we have a more or less linear relationship that is positive. That is there, at the first glance, there is no protective effect of biodiversity on pathogen diversity. That's something that has been studied at a global scale in different biomes. If you have high biodiversity, you, you get also a lot of pathogens, to put it simply. So where do we have the protective mechanism of biodiversity? And that comes here. So we still have host diversity on the x-axis, but we exchange pathogen diversity on the y-axis by the overall infection. That is the percentage of, let's say, animals in a community that is infected by a pathogen. And then we get this negative relationship that is a protective function of biodiversity on infection and health risk. And this effect is called a dilution effect. And I will also come back to this with some examples. So if we first look at some examples uh, of wetland pathogens, here's an, an example of schistosomiasis, that is a um, disease also called snail fever that predominantly occurs in tropic areas. It's caused by a parasitic flatworm. And it occurs especially in wetland systems that have a very, very, very strong human impact. That is hydropower dams and also irrigation channels. And they are have been studies that are included also in, in this paper that I cite here, uh, where it has been shown that dam failure 
or removal of dams actually results in the mitigation of the problem. That is, dam removal in streams results in, um, in a decreased risk for schistosomiasis. So this is really good news. Here, also in re reference to what is planned in, in Merlin, dam removal. Okay, so here we really have a pathogen um, that is negatively impacted then by the nature restoration. This is good news. Then I put another example here, and that is uh, tularemia, which is a fairly common zoonotic and also vector borne disease in Europe with a rather complicated transmission cycle. The, it's different vectors that are involved, both ticks, mosquitoes, different fleas, even amoeba. Small mammals can carry the, the, the bacteria causing tularemia. Small mammals can spread it to hares, also than to beavers. There's also environmental persistence of the bacterium in either soil or wetlands. And all these different components can contribute to the infection of humans. So wetlands have an important role here. And then if we look at just an example of uh, the temporal change in the incidence of tularemia, that is the number of human cases per 100,000 uh, inhabitants here in, in Sweden, there's a clear increase of incidence over time. And the picture is very similar all over Europe, even though the statistics are not that available for many other European countries. So how come that we have an increase here? We did one study looking at the association between wetness around localities where found dead hairs that had been infected with tularemia were found. So you see the map here of, of Sweden and all the red dots are places where people have found hairs, they were dead, and then these hairs were analyzed for tularemia, for the bacterium. And what we did then was we did a landscape analysis on the landscape properties around these places where these hairs with and without the bacterium were found. And there's a clear relationship here between the wetness index of the, of the soil within different buffers, just here exemplified with a buffer of 500 meters, and the probability of the hairs to carry the bacteria. So here in this study, we focused on the, on the hairs, but there's also other studies that actually illustrate the um, importance of wetness for the human cases. And then what is then the relationship between this wetness and and tularemia. So if we look at the types of wetlands that have been created in a really huge amount, at least in Sweden, but also Finland and also other European countries during the last decades, that is wetlands created by beavers. And it's four different examples here of potential or of wetland types created by beavers. And all these types, they are largely great habitat for mosquito larvae to hatch. And it's, as you have seen in the transmission cycle, mosquitoes are involved, but then also, of course, beavers are involved. So it might be that actually these beaver wetlands, that they create a perfect storm for vectors and also other potential reservoirs because we also know that small mammals, they can be infected by the, by the bacteria and they also spread the bacteria 
to people. And then I mentioned mosquitoes. And there are now constantly new mosquito species that are introduced to Europe from different parts of the world. And these mosquitoes, they spread new and emerging diseases. And this is caused both um, by simply the, the introduction, but also then amplified by climate change. And there are several diseases that are listed here, and I will come back to, to some of them. Um, and one hotspot for, for example, chikungunya fever disease is that is, has been identified by ECDC, so ECDC, not ACDC, it's the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And one of these hotspots for chikungunya is actually the Danube Delta, where also restoration measures are planned in Merlin. And of course, the types of, of wetlands with these rather shallow waters and also neutral rich wetlands that are created are perfect habitat for many mosquito species, not all. I exemplified here with uh, one mosquito species, uh, this Albopictus. It's one of the most invasive mosquito species uh, globally. Um, it doesn't necessarily need the type of wetlands that you see here on, to the right hand. It, there it might actually be sufficient with just um, a rain barrel uh, full with water in your backyard. That is sufficient for this species to, to, um, to hatch the larvae. But wetlands are associated with mosquitoes. Then we have ticks that also have increased in their distribution range really dramatically, especially towards the north during the last decades. And when we think about nature restoration and wetland restoration, what we would like to restore is also the riparian zone of various wetlands. And many of the riparian zones are characterized by um, herbs, grasses, like you can see here from some of the lake shores in, in Sweden, where we have a perfect habitat for ticks. So when we restore our, our wetlands, we might actually create risky habitats here illustrated by, by the ticks. Then when restoring uh, water bodies, we might have these species in mind that we want to favor whether it's otters or salmonid fish species, white-backed woodpeckers, dippers, or also we want to favor beavers or bats like this Darbenton's bat illustrated here that frequently hunts over open wetland areas. These are some target species. Some of them are rather specialized, but what we actually risk to get in terms of um, species communities, at least in the short term, and short term here I refer to maybe up to 10, 15, 20 years that it might take to for um, a wet or degraded wetland to recover properly. So what we might get is actually rather um, small mammals like this bank wall here, rats, or muskrat that you see in the, in the uh, in the bottom here, and vectors like ticks and mosquitoes. So, and the shaded species here, what characterizes them is these are generalist species. They can cope with a lot of different environments. I mean, beavers, their, their only requirement is there has to be some water, but that can even be a simple boring ditch where they build their dam and then you have a beef habitat. And so it's not only that they are generalists, but what is it that characterizes generalist species? Yes, 
they often are hyper reservoirs. That is, they host a lot of different pathogens. And then we also have some of the most important vectors for rather nasty diseases among these groups. And it's a long table here, but what I just want to illustrate here is that with these different species that you saw on the, on the previous slide or species groups, there is a lot of different, both zoonotic and vector-borne diseases associated. And this is true for, for beavers, for other small rodents, especially uh, bats, mosquitoes, and ticks. And you find tularemia, for example, for all these groups. Then we have other uh, diseases um, associated with the different pathogens that are of varying importance already now in different European countries and, we, and where we will see probably an increase over the next few years and decades. And for example, for the bats, we have uh, one recent study uh, that is now in, in print on Daubenton's bat. We actually also found coronaviruses. Um, so it's, these species groups are important for the transmission of different diseases. So this is the bad news. But now let's look at the good news. And that is predators are actually good for our health. And I illustrate this uh, with the, the Tangman's owl that you find here um, with um, a bank vole that is caught by it. And owls in general are really efficient in um, preying on, on rodents. But what is really the, the good news here is that they not only prey on, on rodents, they prey preferably selectively on infected ones. And this is something that we have shown both for tularemia and also hunter virus infections. That is one or another um, important zoonotic disease in different parts of, of Europe. So this is really good news. So predators selectively are removing infected animals that otherwise could make us humans sick. Then some other nature-based solutions that could then be used. So, I mean, to, to reintroduce owls might be difficult, but you can provide nest boxes that many owls really easily accept and where they then nest. Um, cats are also efficient uh, hunters on, on rodents, even though, of course, we don't want feral cats in the city areas. Um, then stoats or foxes is also something, or these are species groups that are very good at hunting uh, rodents, hyper reservoirs. Um, but you might not have them, especially not in, uh, close to, to cities or even in urban areas. But what you could use then is um, propellants. You can spread smell of predators to, smell, to spread the smell of, for example, fox urine. Or we actually tested this with wolf urine to get rid of beavers, and that actually works. Um, what is also a good way to at least get rid partly on mosquitoes is to, to support um, nesting sites for swifts and swallows. Um, they are very efficient in hunting mosquitoes and then thereby removing potential um, vectors that could infect us people. Additional interventions then of course include also, especially then in, in urban areas, to mow the grass, um, to avoid that you have habitats where people take the walk their dogs, uh, where people actually also can uh, get in contact with, with uh, for example, ticks to remove the grass or the herbs. Um, 
then in especially urban areas, you can also promote more the use of um, mosquito nets, something that is standard in, in many northern countries. Um, you can use repellents for, for different vectors. And something that is also very important is um, to inform, elucidate the public on potential risks and maybe also to put up signs that warn the public for potential risks. So when I look at some of the, the restoration projects that will be performed in Merlin, um, I see actually potential risks for these projects promoting uh, risk for vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, at least in short term. And I think it would be wrong to neglect this and say, no, this will not happen. I think a better approach would be to acknowledge that this risk actually might be there and then more go into how can we cope with this. And therefore, as a take home message, I would say, yes, wetland restoration might induce disease risk, but the good news is also that there, that we might be able to develop a, a toolbox, at least already now, there are different tools available to mitigate this risk, including either introduction or reintroduction of predators, creation of landscape of fear by, for example, spreading the, the uh, urine of, or the scent of potential predators of reservoirs, different public health interventions, and especially also to educate the, the public on such potential risk. And with that, I would like to, to thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Frauke. Very clear uh, presentation. Um, so clear that we only have one question. Maybe you answered everything. But uh, I got to, uh, by the way, I just want to say to everyone, um, if you have a question and it just occurs to you and you don't want to type it in, please use the reaction button and raise your hand and I'll try to recognize you. Uh, so you can verbally ask your question or you can type your question into the chat. So we have one question here from Agata Klimkowska of Wetlands International. Are there any proven published and clearly demonstrated cases when wetland or peatland restoration can be linked with no doubts with an increase in vector density or increase in disease infections in the region? The relations are logic, but these are still hypothetical. Can we say that in any region catchment, the wetland restoration contributed to the increase in human health risk? In any case, a restoration of entire ecosystems, including animals and predators, would be rather a good thing to do. Yeah, thank you. That's, of course, a very important um, question. There are some examples, and I distributed uh, this morning some links to the organizers where I referred to a study that, which is a, yeah, more or less like a, a review article um, in infectious diseases, uh, a journal article that reviews examples where this actually has been, yeah, where this already happened. But I would also say, that the evidence so far is not that, that big. Um, I mean, nature restorations, okay, it, it has been going on for a while, um, but there are, I would say, not really that many good studies that convincingly um, have proven this, but in this, one of these review articles, there's, uh, there are some examples. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in from Daniel Herring. 
So in Germany, floodplain restoration results often in much higher abundances of mosquitoes. They do not necessarily transmit diseases, but are a nuisance. Increased mosquito abundance caused a lot of resistance in the communities nearby towards further restoration measures. Do you have any experiences or ideas how to address this resistance? Mm -hmm. So experience in, in that sense, I mean, I'm living in, in Northern Sweden and mosquitoes are a daily problem here, at least during, during the, the summer. And I mean, there, nobody would go outside just in a, in a t-shirt, uh, even not daytime. Um, you put on either repellents or some, some clothes that protect you. Um, you would not leave your window open um, during the night. You, or you can have it open, but you always have a mosquito net. So um, I, I think to, and, and then we also know that we have, it's not far from, from Stockholm, just 200 kilometers. There's a huge wetland area where people really got that annoyed regarding the mosquitoes that the density of mosquitoes was 90,000 per cubic meter during summer. And there the authorities actually applied um, um, a biochemical treatment of the, of the water, affected water bodies to get rid of the mosquito larvae. And it works. So there are examples where you either can get rid of the problem or more or less educate people and say, hmm, it's, it's maybe something that we have to accept and adapt to. Okay, um, I am not seeing any hands raised, or, but I therefore as a moderator take a liberty and I will um, ask you as a systems ecologist, we know, you know, sustainability science was driven often by the fact that we had ecological catastrophes because our view was too narrow. And therefore we have worked for 50, 60 years to have a broader, more comprehensive view uh, to look at all the feedbacks. I mean, it's one reason we recognize ecosystem services. Um, so we talk about disease increase, but of course there are many, many reasons why wetlands are regarded as a benefit for the ecosystem services. And I've just mentioned that there is a movement in some countries that they may start having agricultural subsidies for carbon sequestration and bogs are as good as anything at sequestering car, uh, carbon. So how do we continue the debate without only focusing on the disease, which is a hot button issue politically and balance our view between these different ecosystem services? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure if I really have a straight answer here, but I think an important approach would actually to, to be um, to look at the different potential benefits, but also pitfalls and risks associated with restoration. And then it, it's um, to, to weigh these different risks and benefits against each other. That is something that we have done in, in Sweden in a previous Interreg project in relation to, uh, to beavers, their potential services, but then also looking at the disservices and um, developed a, a matrix where you can add the different um, benefits and um, potential risks and associated with specific systems. So not just as a, as a, at a national scale, but really benefits and problems associated with specific systems. And then you see whether your matrix is more or less dominated by, by green squares where you say, okay, it's good, um, no problem. Or where you actually have specific problems like damage of infrastructure. Um, there doesn't matter how green your other uh, squares and your matrix are. If infrastructure is affected, that probably will result in a removal of a beaver system. But I mean, at, at least I mean, I totally agree that we don't. We must not focus just on the diseases. My my point is more that this might be an 
undesirable effect of what we are doing and mm -hmm. that we must not just uh, ignore it. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have now just in the chat a comment, but maybe uh, it's again from uh, Agata Klimkowska. Uh, she says, similarly in the Netherlands, mosquitoes are a reason for, that, uh, for opposition to projects, although the densities are much, much, much less. The more aquatic life of Vivians, no standing water, and often more understanding where the mosquitoes are coming from is important. In some cases, it's proven that most insects came from garden ponds, not from wetland restoration. Mm -hmm. So I, I think an important point, uh, at least also in relation to mosquitoes, is um, that it, I think it, if we are restoring, I think we are also in the position to be able to design how at least some of our wetlands uh, should look like or how we want them to look like. And there, I mean, problems with mosquitoes um, to a large degree also associated with a lot of emerging vegetation being in these wetlands, whereas more open uh, waters are not really favoring mosquito larvae or mosquitoes hatching in the, in the system. So I, I think how to design the, these wetlands can also be a, a key aspect uh, that should be considered um, to, to mitigate the potential risk from mosquitoes uh, hatching in these systems. Yeah, I could add to that as a former resident of the United States, the massive depots of old tires, uh, rubber tires are huge um, reservoirs for mosquitoes uh, and mosquito breeding sites. So that's all artificial. Uh, there's a, a comment from Pahout, Bastian Pahout saying, maybe it was said, but why do predators focus on infected targets? I guess they are weaker than others and so easier to catch. Isn't applying urine or something else going against the installation of predators in the freshly restored areas? Mm -hmm. So the first point, yes. So um, for several pathogens, we know that, um, for example, rodents, um, they are not only affected by the path pathogens, but they actually are diseased. That is, somehow they are affected. For hunter virus infections, we know that um, the bank voles, um, they move more and they pee more, which makes them easier to see and to catch for the, for the owls. Uh, for tularemia, we know that um, the small rodents, voles, they die within two to three weeks. So there the, the animals are really suffering from the infection, which also makes them easier prey. Um, the other part um, we're, we're regarding applying urine, um, um, I, I, I mean, if you spread uh, fox urine, for example, this is uh, nothing that would prevent an owl or a tangmarum's owl from, from nesting in the area. Um, there, it could actually also be that you then have a double effect, one from the owls and one from the creation of a landscape of fear by spreading the urine. I hope this answers the, the question. Thank you. Uh, Agata Klimkowska wanted to point out that she's in the Waterlands project, which is focusing very much on bogs, a uh, sister project. So these are very important subjects for them. So that's, that's a wonderful uh, combination. Daniel Herring posted a comment, perhaps you can respond to it, an overall look at beaver reintroduction quite problematic in terms of methane emissions, diseases, lots of problems with adjacent land use. It is certainly not the holy grail. In which circumstances would you nevertheless recommend beaver reintroduction? Oh, wow. <laughs> this is a really tough one. Um, so, I mean, in, if I look at um, how the reintroduction of, of beavers um, occurred in, in Sweden, there we have partly really remote areas 
where no one cares. So uh, these are probably, at least re regarding the, sorry, the methane aspect is, is important, but in, in terms of potential human conflicts caused by, by beavers in terms of infrastructure or also um, agricultural land, it's mostly forestry there. Um, and there, in many cases, the forest land is owned by, by big forest companies and the big enterprises, they are in favor of the beavers because they say um, the productive forest that is lost to beavers by beavers flooding the riparian areas, that's almost negligible. It's in comparison to the whole forest area, it's almost nothing. And in the riparian zones, they are the companies are not allowed to clear cut anyhow. So there's um, a win-win in terms of biodiversity. And then the, the company is saying, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but I mean, in the, now we see a tendency for beavers um, moving, migrating southwards in Sweden into also agricultural areas where a lot of efforts have been put into the restoration of riparian zones along streams uh, and also ditches. And that is, of course, there I think we will see a lot of, lot of problems. Um, and there, uh, I'm not really sure how to, how to solve this. Um, there, I, I could imagine that also some kind of compensation paid to, or subsidies paid to, to farmers could be one solution. Um, but I mean, the, the methane that is, uh, um, if I mean, there are only so far only a few studies that have looked into it, um, but the production is, is huge in beaver dams. So this is definitely an issue and um, I'm not really sure how to solve it. Um, but this is also an issue where I think that newly formated beaver dams are a bigger problem than recolonized systems. So in Sweden, we are now in a, in a phase where we have the second or third generation of, of beaver systems after their recolonization. And we haven't done the, the measurements yet, but what we see from, from other um, um, environmental compounds like methyl mercury, um, there we, we know that the effect of methyl mercury production is lower in recolonized systems than in newly flooded uh, systems. And that is related to the um, char characteristics of the organic carbon that is available. Um, but I, I think th this will be an important issue to, to look more into. Yeah, I think uh, we also can look at that in the framework of, again, we think of one species introduction, but when you have something like reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone, it was the wolves returning that allowed the beavers to come there and you had much more of an entire system. So you had benefits cascading in, in multiple directions, uh, but it's much more difficult to think about that in Europe, you know, uh, but, you know, as a, as a restoration measure. We have a comment here again from Agata Klimkowska. Even without reintroduction, beavers are coming, especially in large scale projects. And it's actually quite good. They do a good job with re-wetting. I would suggest it's one of the trade-offs in wetland restoration project. Yeah, I, I agree. But, but then it's also the, the question how to weigh the, the different trade-offs if there's something that we uh, should do, need to do. Um, then how to weigh the, the different aspects. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I keep taking the liberties of asking questions, I'll annoy people enough and they'll start asking more questions. Um, as a systems ecologist, I gave an address to a network of uh, scientists in October talking about how what we do to the landscapes makes the pandemics more likely. And especially in South Asia, the locating of major factories for geese and pigs out in the hinterland where it's more likely they encounter zoonoses, uh, the clear cutting of forests. There are, there are many ways in which we're making landscape changes 
that make zoonoses much, much more likely. And I believe they need to be taken into account when we look at this, uh, that that may be a far bigger factor in endangering us to zoonoses than simply wetland restoration, to see it within a context of how we've rearranged landscapes as a whole. If you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. Um, I mean, that is something that we have looked quite a lot in, and so not in relation to, to COVID-19, but in relation to other pathogens, um, degradation of the forest landscape by clear cutting. That is definitely something that promotes um, occurrence and prevalence of both zoonotic and vector-borne pathogens, whether it's related to, to hunter virus infections, whether it's related to borreliosis or Lyme, Lyme disease, whether it's related to, to leremia. Um, and here, I, I think, um, yeah, we, we need to put more effort into in the, in the future, also regarding, okay, if there is a disease risk, um, how can we mitigate it? Um, is it really just virgin natural forest where we, where we have a safe place? Or is there a way to, to manage and potentially design landscapes that um, have a lower disease risk? And I, I think a key aspect here is uh, we just have um, a manuscript uh, that is now in, under revision in Nature Communications on the importance of generalist species. I mentioned it during the talk. Um, it's these generalist species that survive habitat destruction, habitat degradation. And it's also those species that we frequently see are the dominating ones either during nature restoration processes or within short term after degradation, uh, after restoration. I mean, if you use heavy machines to restore nature, um, it probably works to, to gain the long-term goal for the re restoration, but in short term, it's a type of degradation that favors generalists, uh, whether it's um, among the vectors or the, uh, the reservoirs in, in terms of, of uh, rodent species. And, and I think that there we have um, a uh, rather huge problem. Um, but there I can also mention um, I'm coordinating um, or I have coordinated an EU application within Horizon Europe, BPREP, where we, and this project is now, um, it's uh, subject to, to negotiations now, so this has been recommended for funding, where we hopefully then will actually be able to go to some of Merlin's and the sister project uh, superb to these sites and look more into this disease risk aspects. Yeah, especially with Lyme disease or borreliosis, uh, we found in the United States that the building extensively of suburbs is creating more edge. And so edge species have thrived and interior species have declined. And the edge species are, you know, Paramiscus leucopus, white-footed mouse, as well as deer, which are both uh, reservoirs for borreliosis. So uh, I see no more questions. That's why I tried to stick one more comment in there, get, trying to give a little more time for someone to, to make a question. Um, if we have no further questions, uh, I would thank everyone for their participation. And I would like to point out that we have a webinar coming up in one month, and that'll be Julia Rideau, the water policy officer for WWF. She works in Brussels in their policy office. And the title of her talk will be the EU Nature Restoration Law, a chance for binding the EU to river restoration. And I believe this will be on the 4th of April. And, um, I'm going to paste a link into the chat to, so if you would like to look at this further. So please, if you're interested in this, uh, this is uh, 
promises to be. I'm, I regret I will not be able to be here, but uh, I believe Sebastian Birk will take over as moderator for that webinar. So I, I ask one more time, if there are any further comments to, to finish off uh, and round this out. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So I'd like to again, thank you for a very clear uh, presentation and very clear answers. Um, this is being recorded and will be available through the Merlin Project website, if you would like to see it again. So thanks to all for uh, good participation and we're looking forward to seeing you the next time.